Good afternoon. My name is Sasha Golob, and I'm the co-director of the Centre for Philosophy and Visual Arts, CPVA, at King's College London. Welcome to this edition of CPVA Artist Interviews, where I'll be talking with the Scottish sculptor, Kenny Hunter. Kenny's exhibited extensively, both in Britain and abroad, including solo shows at Arnolfini, the Scottish National Portrait Gallery, CCA Glasgow, Art Connexion in Lille, France, the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, Tramway, and many others. I'm going to be discussing with him today his recent work and a range of themes from his practice over the last few decades. I began by asking Kenny about the relationship between his practice and the monumental tradition of public sculpture. Kenny, thank you so much for joining us today. So I'd like to start by just asking you, talking a little bit about the relationship between your, your practice and uh, public sculpture and the monumental tradition more broadly. I mean, I guess so often the public sculptures we see are these kind of m immovable monuments to a kind of inexorable progress. You know, they're kind of generals and politicians sort of staring down at us, you know, staring down on a society that looks, looks very different from their own often. Um, whereas many of your public works, there's a sort of celebration or a toying with um, a kind of transience or a kind of um, a kind of opportunism at times. I've been thinking of, of pieces like the eye goat, you know, this sort of playful skipping to the, stop of the, the top of these, these crates. Um, so I was wondering if you could start by just telling us a little bit how you see that, that relationship to the tradition. Well, I think, first of all, I think there's, there's, a, there's an obligation on the artist to frame the zeitgeist, you know, to reflect um, the world as they see it, experience it, yeah, yeah. share it with other people. But there's also, for me, uh, uh, this is a subjective response, is a, for me there's an obligation to sort of uh, talk, feel the past or communicate about the past or take on board the idea that history is, is fundamental in shaping identity and identity is fundamental in shaping the public discourse. So we can't, we can't forget uh, or, or, or not get involved in discussions about identity and yeah. that relates very strongly in my mind to history and how we and who frames history, Yeah, yeah. Uh, who, who selects the people on the plinths, etc. Yeah. Um, so my, my strategy, if you like, is to think of what is now and what has always been. So I'm always looking for things that have a, a sense of a feedback loop. That the work that I make has some kind of uh, relationship to former models uh, of the past, but it also has a, 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 a zeitgeist moment in it as well. Like for instance, I did a sculpture of a of a of a deer, um, but it was a deer that was hunted in, in an urban hunt in Glasgow. And it was a new, it was a new story. A new story came out, and it was a uh, kids had got bored of their playstations and were hunting um, deer with crossbows and dogs, pet dogs, because the urban deer had come into Glasgow post uh, industrial Glasgow, which yeah. had cre greened up and yeah. cleaned its act up. So animals were coming back in the city. Yeah. So that was a very now moment, you know. It, it was a very, it very spoke of a particular time in Glaswegian uh, history. Yeah. Um, and modern history, if we're, sorry, the modern zeitgeist. But it also spoke about the very first art was probably the hunt scene, you know. If we look back at yeah. cave painting, yeah. right. So the first blood was probably first paint was probably animal blood yeah yeah and that so it's something absolutely ancient about about humanity humanity's history but it had a kind of uh it molded itself into a very 21st century version of that so yeah that's just a roundabout way of saying that that's that's my position as an artist I don't, yeah. I don't i don't try and separate the two i don't believe that art starts at the turn of the at the start of the 20th century. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm compelled to look at these other older cultures as well. I next asked Kenny about the possibility of an open-ended or democratizing tradition of public sculpture. The next issue I wanted to talk about, I guess, you know, building on some of the things we've discussed already is, um, is the relation between public sculpture and ideas of a community. So, I mean, there's one tradition that I suppose you see philosophically represented by people like Heidegger, which has this idea that there'll be a sort of monumental work that will create a community that will sort of define the values of it, that will show people a vision of the world and a vision of themselves. Um, and at times, some of your work references that tradition, but then also there's, there's a, a sense of, um, 
I guess, a democratizing and of an open-endedness to it, that mm. it should be a work that fosters a sense of doubt or a sense of um, questioning, but mm. one that nevertheless also forms kind of communal bonds. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think the monumental tradition has been, um, is articulated usually with very clear, simple messages. This was a great man, this was an important battle. These values are for all, for all time, are timeless values. Um, and I think, you know, in the, in the accelerated culture that we live in now, that seems a kind of uh, vain and kind of um, not fit for purpose type of thing. But I think there's, I, I agree that the, what's still valid and good about the monumental tradition is it is a non-functioning object within the civic landscape. Yeah, but yeah. Within the urban landscape, it doesn't, it does not a table, it's not a chair, it's not a lamp, it's not a yeah. waste paper bin, a building. It's, it's an object which talks about bigger issues, about society, about who we are, uh, of what holds us together, all those sort of things. So yeah. um, we, could, we could argue that, this, that society is still running along the lines of hierarchies now, but it's not it's one that people uh, want to express yeah. or want to um, celebrate. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're, we're suspicious of hierarchies, we're suspicious of orthodoxies, generally speaking. People are allowed more freedom of expression, so there's lots more competing subgroups uh, within society, within a kind of um, multicultural society. So how does the public artwork function if we can't all get behind one particular image? Yeah, if it's a yeah. faith-based thing or a political thing? Yeah, yeah. You know, so the public artist has to respond to that. And for me, the most important thing to do is to, is to leave an artwork open, yeah. is to leave an artwork um, conflicted yeah, almost yeah. so quite often the works that i use are, have things like bronze or bases so the public immediately can frame it within the idea of the monument and and and, and the civic sculpture but on closer inspection there's uh, there's aspects that are maybe yeah conflict i mean for example citizen firefighter yeah, is a good example that, yeah. whereby the the usual expectation of elevation is brought down to quite a low level whereby yeah. the sculpture is completely accessible and easy to touch but it's raised up just enough to say this is a special job a little ab above the other citizens um, but not to such an, a pompous level yeah, that, that yeah. the firefighter feels uncomfortable yeah, with. Yeah. Um, it's also there's no uh, face so there's no race age gender emotional state most importantly there's no emotional state revealed yeah yeah and the kit does the work so you just think well if you have to wear this kind of clothing to go to work yeah it's yeah, dangerous yeah you don't have to be smashing the door down with an axe holding a baby yeah to get the idea but most of importantly was the idea that anonymity means that the you get a, you can project a subjective reading onto the work yeah another example of that i would say would be the unknown which is a, a sculpture i've done in sutherland right on the very northern coast of scotland and within that area that was notorious for the Highland Clearances where, where, where whole villages were kind of eradicated and told to leave their, their, their homes overnight virtually. So there's a sense of absence within that landscape. It's very deep rooted and it's still kind of felt now. Um, but you also have um, evidence of Iron Age people and burial chambers and uh, duns and all these different Bronze Age settlements. Yeah. Um, and you also have this mythology around yes. uh, uh, giants, which were these, there was erratic boulders were dropped around the Cairngorm uh, plain, which myths built up around that, that giants were throwing them around. So the figure I built was a giant skeleton. So this figure could dovetail in with mythology. It could dovetail in with uh, recent, well, relatively recent history like the Highland Clearances or things like the Bronze or, and uh, Iron Age people who had been in that area. Um, the figure also was just uh, stripped of all sp specificity, it was right down to the human armature, isn't it? The skeleton, so there's no, again, all the other things that we normally subdivide up, gender, race, blah, 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 blah all gone. Yeah. Uh, and there's just this sort of armature, a core of, of, of humanity, yeah. kind of dominating this, this kind of fairly empty, uh, quite, quite barren looking hillside and so this the context is half the work you know and actually the journey to get to the work yeah, yeah. is part of it as well because 
you, you, you have to walk there. And that's another important thing. It's a real slowdown artwork. Yeah, that's helpful. I mean, actually, another, another piece I wanted to ask about in this context is a military figure. So again, the face is, the face is occluded. You can't see who it is. Um, and that brings in some of these same ambiguities, some of the same ability to project onto it, you know, particularly which side of the fight is this person on, right? Yeah, and the title military figure is, you know, it could be UK military or paramilitary or yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's just left hanging, yeah, really. Yeah. Um, and what I loved about that sculpture was colour. Again, that's another thing yeah, that yeah. sculpture isn't always at home with, but I love colour and as, 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 as a means of translating meaning. And the, the, the camouflage blends perfectly into the, yeah. the natural world. Yeah, yeah. And the um, human underneath it is this kind of pinkish, airfix kind of pink yeah. face, which shows the separation of, 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 uh, of, of the human, you know, like if, if an animal is like water and water, which was yeah, George Bataille, yeah, yeah. then the, we are like oil and water. So that was, yeah. it was that was in my head when I thought that would be a nice way of articulating that and also the landscape which is the figure stands on is very idealized bucolic yeah, yeah. chirping frogs and uh yeah friendly yeah, you know yeah. it's 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 not um realistic you know yeah. it's, it's it's an imagined thing that he's sort of in a way protecting or or, or bonding with yeah i've always loved that but quote um and i mean i suppose it takes us back to this this issue we talked on earlier about the, the human-animal relationship. Um, and I mean, I know one, one thing you've been interested in in this regard is John Gray. Yeah, he was a, a pivotal kind of read. You know, I actually picked up uh, the book uh, in, in a train station. Not you, you mean much. Straw Dogs? Straw Dogs, yeah, yeah, yeah. Straw Dogs. And uh, it, was, it, it was such a radical text in the sense that it, it, it was saying that basically we are all operating on the same triggers as uh, yeah. an animal, that sex and survival. Uh, we're no different. Yeah. We're, this thing, free will, if you actually put it under pressure, yeah, yeah. it's kind of a bit shaky. Yeah. The evidence isn't good, you know? Yeah. We're quite consensual. We're quite driven by what society expects of us. We go along with things. And he, he, he makes a kind of comparison to like a river. You know, you're, I think it was him. He was like, you go down a river and yeah. you're, making, you're making frantic paddling to the left and the right, but essentially you're going down that river and you're not in control. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, and I think that's how how someone like Nietzsche thinks about it, that you can, you know, there's some sense in which you might be able to make relatively small adjustments, yeah. um, but it's a matter of sort of shoving against a current and that current's often going to be too strong for you. Yeah. Um, so th those things we think about animal virtues like loyalty and yeah. bravery and empathy. Yeah. And, you know, these, these, these are the things that humans hold up as, as of great value. And yeah. It's very hard to say this is a distinctly human virtue. Yeah, yeah. I, I cannot see replicated in the animal kingdom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and I often see, you know, philosophical theories that do have some very hard line between us and animals. I sometimes see them, I guess, a bit like monumental sculptures, an attempt to put up on a plinth a vision of ourselves that we'd like to have, but um, not yeah. necessarily one that bears much relation. Well, that's to this is that. Yeah, yeah. The next topic we discussed was the animal, the role of the animal in his sculptural practice, and the relationship of the animal and the human. I mean, the presence of animals is a, is a constant throughout your work. And um, the piece that I, I mentioned, I go, where you have this, uh, this goat on the plinth and there are others like um, animal virtues, where again, you've had kind of animals ascending in, place, in places that in some sense um, mimic or toy with or reference these mm. kind of um, you know, places of superiority, places of dominance for the monumental tradition. But it's interesting because someone might say, I mean, a kind of more simple way of thinking about it might be, well, you know, we need to put the humans who haven't been on the plinths mm. on the plinths, you know, so it should mm. be about putting minority groups on the plinths. So could you say something about how you see the role of animals specifically and why animals or how it relates to that kind mm. of issue? Well, I think obviously there's a, there's a huge history of the anthropomorphic and how through symbolism and language we've used the animal form to talk about human affairs. Um, and that's a well-documented yeah, yeah. thing in itself but there's also I see a more current debate now about animal consciousness yeah and where that sits you know uh, and animal uh, ethics you know uh, how do we how do we as humans interact with them and obviously that's a very much more zeitgeist thing because there was a time when th it was very clear 
there's a clear steer on it. We have dominion over the beasts, and yeah, yeah. or Descartes saying that there yeah. were machines. And, yeah, yeah. You know, but there's not many people aligned with that yeah. idea now, and people are getting more and more uneasy about. Uh, I think it's something like four percent of the of the of the life forms on this planet are now wild. Yeah, yeah. The rest are either us or livestock. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's so although again the animal form is ancient and appears in art, it is also you know we can look at the animal form in a way that speaks about how we're experiencing life now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm very. It's, it's a very, it's a very, and it's also there's lots of bad animal art as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's it's a it's a it's a tightrope walk, you know. We, we know there's lots of, you know, people like an ornament of a horse or something, yeah, yeah, or, or a dog, yeah. or can you paint my dog for me, sort of thing. So <laughs> there's there's all these kind of, uh, but there's also some amazing art that deals with the animal form yeah, as yeah. well. Um, but yeah, I think I think I'm interested in animal consciousness and and uh, and maybe part of that. Elevation of the animal, the, almost the accidental monument, you know that the, the you know the, the fox had climbed on top of a a bunch of old street furniture, of a bunch of old yeah. uh, cabinets that had been thrown out of a house, and it kind of for a second coalesced into a kind of monumental form. Yeah, yeah. And I kind of said, make let's make that. Um, and it was because I think the animals who live in the city are are, are niche animals. They're survivors. They've to come uh, in the wake of human activity, normally animals are re reduced or, or, or made extinct. Yeah, yeah. Whereas some animals have come back into urban areas and forged a kind of place in that yeah. world, like the fox or the peregrine falcon or the. In London, I think you've got parakeets or something. Yeah, we do everywhere. Yeah. All these strange kind of uh, yeah. like uh, hiccups, like in the natural order, in a way. You would, uh, and with yeah, so. The, I, I think these animals are are, um, are often we have this problem that if an animal is rare, it's seen as cute and of great value. Yeah. Uh, and animals, when there's too many of them, become a problem. Yeah. Um, so uh, and but ultimately, we are the plague species. Yeah, yeah. If you look at the numbers, how they stack up. Um, so I'm I'm all for rehabilitating seagulls in the eyes of the public. Yeah, yeah. And saying they're brilliant things. I mean, that was something that I found particularly interesting actually is, is the choice, not just this question of sort of pushing or problematizing the animal human boundary or how we think about that boundary, but also the choice of which animals. Mm. Um, you know, so, I mean, you mentioned a few of them, but also all, all the time it seems to be animals that are in some sense deep, deeply interwoven with, but irreducible to human activity. I mean, so another interesting case is um, the calf sculpture, mm. um, you know, where it's standing on if I understand this correctly, what's partly a, a sort of piece of astroturf and then it's partly also a, a crate, mm, mm. Um, presumably referencing the kind of transport of them. And, mm. um, but then it's got this sort of ritualistic aspect, you know, obviously have the sacred role. And so mm. it's sort of embodying all these complex um, interplays between the sacred and the profane and, mm. and the, way, the way in which animals have been, I guess, used, abused, worshipped, ignored, mistreated, mm. made central. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the sacrificial was yeah. right at the core of religion, isn't it? Yeah, the theories yeah. Of, theories yeah. of religion. Yeah. Come, so, and that again goes back to a much older way of living with animals. And I'm really interested in what John Berger had to say yeah, in yeah. His, his pamphlet, Why Look at Animals, because he, we think of human history, there's like, if we're, if we're say 200,000 years old as a species, there's probably at least 150,000 years of that has been about with living with animals. Yeah, yeah. And animal husbandry and all that, um, and and those people you could say, we could say, what did, how did Berger say? He said they were hap, uh, happy to care for the animal, but happy to salt away the pork. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they didn't worry about the and. Yeah, <laughs> they didn't worry about the and. There wasn't there was, there was no clash there, you know. Whereas a modern mind is finds it difficult to understand how you could slaughter an animal, kill one, yeah. because we're so sorry, slaughter and and care for it. Yeah. So. We're totally separated uh, in our in our de in our compartmentalized um, specialisms. The meat arrives on the table, you know, as a burger or whatever, rather than as a, as part of an animal. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I think I think the that's the thing about about that Berger taps into so well is is, is this uh, sense that this is all very short in terms of human history. It's a blip, a blip. 
you know. Yeah, yeah. We have a, a much longer history of, yeah. uh, of connections with animals. Yeah, and I mean, I suppose your example of the, the Glaswegian hunt is the perfect mm. intersection of the timeless and then the uniquely, the uniquely now. Yeah, and I mean, in this, this context of, of the animal human, there's actually a, a work of yours very near here um, in Leicester Square, so about 10, 15 minutes walk from here, called The Persistence of Vision, which is, I guess, the stages of a blackbird in flight. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems that there's, I guess, a sort of complex nest of references, both to, I guess, both to the relationship between photography and sculpture. I mean, it looks almost like sort of time slice photography. Um, and to the animal human, I mean, again, these themes of the animal at the heart of the urban. Um, so I was wondering if you could say a little bit about the background of that sculpture and how you saw it. Um, yeah, I, th I think initially I wanted a... I know that Leicester Square has a history of the spectacle. Yeah, it's yeah. always been a place there. In fact, there was a natural history museum there where people would show... Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, you would come and see, like, Maori clubs and stuff right, with monkeys right, and, right. and that people would queue around a block for the stuff. Right. And, and in some ways, you know, the new Keanu Reeves film is the new thing that people get off the their sofas monkey, for yeah. and they want to come. So Leicester Square's, I guess, has always provided this, the kind of the jaw-dropping spectacle. Yeah, like. yeah. But maybe it was... When this sort of opportunity came up, it was a very rare building to start with. It had four sides. It's quite an unusual thing for London to yeah. have a four-sided building. Um, and I kept thinking about um, Mybridge and, uh, his, uh, and what an impact he had on visual art and on philosophy and all sorts of things. My bridge is uh, time motion studies, you know, yes. where, he made, where he showed a, a breakdown of how things move in space and Duchamp and all sorts of artists referenced it. He's a really colourful character, actually. Um, and I thought about the blackbird as a subject because I know it wasn't exotic, but I felt like I wanted a bird which somehow reflected to Britain now in a way because they th thrived in Britain they're a niche animal in a way they thrive because the kind of sub suburban garden is perfect for a blackbird to defend. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it, it, and it is quite a feisty little bird as well. And I wanted to take something small and make it big and kind of monumentalise the everyday. Um, and I wanted a bird that was graphic and I wanted a bird which um, uh, it made you kind of look twice a little bit. Yeah, you know, yeah. And, and kind of... Um, because they're actually, if you look into the history of them, they're quite, um, they're wrapped up in Beatles lyrics and Shakespeare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so they are qu quite quintessential, I think. Yeah, if yeah. you think about the garden and, and the kind of, the, the English position of the garden culturally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a garden bird, so, but it, it just felt like, and it, but it had a little bit of exoticism. It has that, that yellow bill and a yellow ring around the eye. Yeah. The male one does, so there's a, it has a sort of graphic quality. Yeah. Um, and I thought about these zoetropes and uh, the, the early birth of cinema came through Mybridge's work. And, yeah. And so it kind of what, used those window apertures to, to reference uh, the, the development of the moving image. Yeah, and I mean, it's interesting the use of one medium, I guess, to, to explore the development of another. I mean, to have mm. the sculpture exploring the kind of genesis of photography and the genesis of, of I guess, of modern cinema. It does seem quite a, um, unusual kind of way to look, but that's, sometimes that's where good things happen. Yeah, no, no, completely, no, absolutely. I next asked Kenny about his views on the destruction of sculpture and the politics of their removal or contextualization. The next thing I wanted to, to ask is maybe to shift back to um, the political in a more direct sense. So one of the sort of most... Um, publicly visible debates about sculpture we've had in the last decade is to do with the, the destruction or the removal of um, monuments from, from past periods. I mean, one interesting thing about this is that in these debates, these, these things have kind of regained a kind of monumentality they'd lost. I mean, these sort of dusty things that people had gone by for ages, or at least most people had gone by for ages without paying any notice to, suddenly become this um, subject of very intensive visibility and very intensive um, contestation. And then you have these um, debates about whether they should be, I guess, destroyed, um, you know, melted down, you know, perhaps contextualized, you know, some people want to sort of a little historical plaque, removed to some kind of museum or, or left in place, um, perhaps just with a change in how we regard them, perhaps for some people with, with no change at all. I mean, I wonder as a, as a sculptor and as someone who's, who's practiced linked so much to the public sphere and to these issues of history, how do you see these kind of debates? 
Um, I'm definitely engaged. I'm really uh, happy that it's going on. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about removing the sculptures insofar as, well, here's, look at post-colonial India or post-Soviet Russia. Yeah, yeah. Where the sculptures, if, if you're up against a really harsh and kind of dictatorial regime, nobody's going to say, I would welcome the pulling down of a statue. It's a great moment of liberation and it's a visible, a tangible thing yeah, yeah, to yeah. say, this is, a, this is a game changer, everything's up for grabs now. Yeah. We've pulled down the statue and you can see it. And then there'll be a kind of a vortex, isn't there, of, of people trying to grab power and, and reshape yeah, that culture. Yeah. So I guess statues have that purpose, that yeah, role. Yeah. The, the, the iconoclasm of, of that moment is, yeah. is, is really powerful. But they also are a record of our cultures. Uh, and, and I think to, de to take them away from the central positions and boulevards and town squares and move them like the Soviet, uh, post-Soviet cultures yeah. did or post-colonial India did, but keep them as a reference to their past, I think for me is, is, is a good... Um, I don't like the idea of melting things down. Um, I think they should be kept yeah, in, in some yeah. form. And I think, let's say, for instance, something like Nelson. You could you could argue he's a he's a he's a colonial figure, but I guess the transition between Britain as an empire into a uh, Commonwealth has been, you know, with a few exceptions, not not as violent as say the fall of Soviet Russia. It's not been as oppressive. So maybe, and it's been gradual. It's not been a huge upheaval. So maybe that transition allows for. Uh, the other thing is that when you melt things down, the discourse ends and discourse enlivens society, right? So if the thing's there and people, some people object and some people want to keep it, then that, that, that engenders that, that discourse. And without that, uh, just to, to, to eradicate huge bits of history, um, I can't help feeling there's something quite, maybe there's a bold thing, maybe there's a boldness to that. But I can't help thinking uh, you'll just replace it with a new orthodoxy which is equally unrealistic. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, that will we'll create some other kind of uh, dynamic which is, is shaped in, 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 into, into some other hierarchy's uh, vision of what we all are. Yeah, I mean, I love, I love this idea that it's, I mean, there's almost a kind of sacrificial calf moment with the sculpture as it's pulled down. That's the point of sort of uh, reordering and of, of uh, public break with what was there previous, that mm. these objects... Um, precisely at the moment they're kind of ripped, ripped out of their moorings up fulfilling a kind of vital function, namely we all now see that things have changed and that it's time for a kind of redo. So it would be a position, I guess, for you of removal being radically distinguished from destruction. And I mean, you have this, this, this quote, which I, I think is a reference originally to Rodin, I'm not sure, the, the mm. one that ends bronze, the retrospection. Yeah, yes. and this idea of the role, the role of sculpture um, particularly in commemorating or remembering or acting as a sort of storage bank for society's past self-images. Mm. Yeah, it has that important role um, as almost like a witness you know, to a particular historical time. Um, but I think it's, society has a right to reframe itself and uh, reboot things. So yeah, I don't think, I mean, the monumental tradition is, even the word monumental, we think of it as almost like that the sculpture's got roots into the ground and, it's, yeah. and it is, the whole thing is hierarchical. If you yeah. think about the way the base pedestal plays yeah, the figure yeah. and, it, and it sets up this idea of a hierarchy straight yeah. away. Um, and it is, doesn't feel very kind of, uh, what's the word, suitable for, 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 for where we are now as a, as a society yeah. when so much is in flux and things are changing rapidly and the discourse is much more varied. Yeah, yeah. Um, and when I suppose the example of the plinth, I mean, it goes back to what we were saying earlier with I goat or with animal virtues, you know, that literally these sort of supposedly immovable kind of classical plinths have been replaced with something that is, is the very essence of a kind of transience of modernity. It's just, you know, perhaps the, the crates in which, I mean, almost anything. Yeah, the, the choice of crates, again, that was yeah, very much, much a sort of a reference to the, this idea of flux. It was, yeah, a, kind of, it was yeah. a, a sort of a, an anti-monument. And the way the crates are kind of aligned in an asymmetric way, um, not only kind of 
undercuts the kind of the hierarchy of, of the monument, but it also in some way reflects London's physicality and yeah. how it feels like neighbourhoods have bolted onto other neighbourhoods. Yeah, yeah. It hasn't got a grand plan. Yeah. That you know that ploughs boulevards or yeah, or, or yeah. a grid system through yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a that was me as, as an artist responding physically as a sculptor to that environment. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and on this issue of, I guess, the kind of pulling down of, of sculptures, I mean, that we've seen, um, you know, so vividly televised, in, particularly in the post-Soviet period, but then all through, um, all through the last decade and more. Um, there's a work of yours that I really like, which has, has a kind of video of the toppling of the sculpture, the destruction of the sculpture by quite literally the next generation, right? Yeah. So I guess, yeah, that probably does sum up my point, really, that... that I allowed my kids to destroy or encourage them to destroy a sculpture yeah. of me. Um, so yeah, I do believe in each generation reframing. And uh, I, when you were talking there, I kind of thinking about the Roads Must Fall campaign. Yeah, 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 yeah. In, in, in South Africa and how I actually was lucky enough to meet one of the organizers of that campaign. And he said that the, it wasn't about the statue, it was about the the racism that was endemic and institutional and low-key that was still affected South Africa, that there had been a big political upheaval and change, yeah, yeah. but the balance of power was still, you know, they still they weren't raising black people up through the system into economic uh, safe lands. You know, they were still it was still harsh to be African uh, in, in South Africa. So, and they felt that the, the institutions of South Africa were holding them back. But they knew that that was a complex and difficult uh, argument to frame for the public uh, because it could easily get dragged into a very kind of specific, uh, yeah, vague yeah. territory uh, or vague territory. And uh, to demand that the sculpture was taken down was something that could fo create a focus for the argument. Yeah, which, yeah. Which would then draw in the media, which would then draw in discourse, and they then hopefully mature the debate a bit more. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that's a nice example, I guess, of the complexities of it in that it's um, a black group demanding that a sculpture of this famous white figure be removed partly in protest against the, you know, inadequacies of education policy of a black, a black run government for the last, um, you know, since the end of the apartheid era. So I guess this complex role in which different, different groups can use and um, react to the symbolism um, of the monumental in different contexts. Finally, we talked about the relationship of his work to the toy aesthetic and how his approach differs from an ironical postmodern one. So the last thing I wanted to, um, to ask you about was the aesthetic of, of some of the sculptures and particularly the way it, it intersects with this idea of the toy. Um, so there's, I mean, again, something like I go, there's a, there's an incredible smoothness there. There's a sort of um, sleekness. There's a plasticity. Um, and this plasticity, I guess, partly referencing also the, the bronze tradition, I suppose, in a way, plastic is our indestructible bronze, right? But it's also, you know, what every kid's toy box is full of. Um, so I was wondering if you could say a little bit about how you see the relationship between the, your aesthetic and that of, that of the toy. Uh, well, I guess I see it as in some ways a kind of hybrid between the toy aesthetic and the high classicism yeah, of the, yeah. the ancient Greeks, whereby the hand of the artist is removed. You, know, you work the material to such a point, there's no gesture, there's yeah. no tooling marks, there's no you know, thumb mark or, yeah, or, or yeah. chisel mark. It's all just sanded away, so the thing becomes almost free from the idea of labor. Yes. Uh, perversely, because it's actually had more labor put yeah, on it, yeah. but it looks like it's somehow just arrived in the world um, because there's no trace yeah. to see how, how it came into being. Um, I also feel it, it kind of, uh, it gives it a different relationship. It becomes goat rather than a goat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's another thing, I suppose. It, it's, ge it's generic quality or, or, you know, it's kind of averaged out, it's reductive quality. Yeah becomes, it, it underlines its, its role as a symbol right, right. rather than as a, a particular animal, right, right. a particular person or whatever. Right. Um, 
that probably, and I just can't stop sanding things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of compulsive. It is, um, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because, I mean, I guess there's another vision of the artist, right, which is, is kind of the romantic, you know, model where, you know, the genius leaves his or her mark on the object and it's important that you see, you know, you see the hand Absolutely, yeah. of the master on, on the piece. So it's a little bit of an anti-author statement in a yeah. strange way that it, it, I often feel that type of work floats off on its own rather more successfully than works that are tied to the, the, the idea of the genius artist and, and their mark. Yeah. Um, and when it you feels more self-contained. Uh, when you say floats off, what do you mean? Um, well, it's, it's more self-contained as an object. Right. And it doesn't depend on that legacy and that building up of the artist's uh, um, trajectory. Right, right. And their work, you know. Right. Because it feels kind of more sealed off. And, yeah. uh, but I know maybe, maybe I've softened that opinion a little bit on that these days. I'm, I'm quite... I do like on close inspection. I like to show... Uh, thoughts on the surface of an artwork. Yeah, yeah. I do. I've, That's I've, a beautiful I've, I've definitely it. changed that opinion now. I'm allowing that more and more into the work. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't believe in a, a perfect artwork. I don't think you can make a perfect artwork. I think um, mistakes are are good, you know, and, and they sort of, in a way, humanise things a bit more. Yeah, yeah. So I think I've become more uh, open to that and more happy to live with error and, and see it as a good thing, actually. I mean, I suppose that fits with a lot of the sort of broader themes of, of the work. And um, I mean, it, it seems more natural to have a thematization of error when the, the sculpture has kind of surmounted a set of packing crates than it does to admit to the possibility of error if you've had to put up a classical plinth and, mm. you know, this is the one and all time yeah. statement of what humanity yeah. should be on top. Yeah. You know, there's a kind of revisability and a kind of fluidity. Actually, that was, I mean, that brings to another thing I wanted to ask on this. So something I've always found really interesting about your work is that there's, there's what you, you talk about, I know, as a freestyling of the monumental tradition. And I suppose, you know, now we could also talk about it as a toying with the monumental tradition to some degree, um, or perhaps a sort of a recycling. But it's not ironic. And that, that's interesting. Um, or at least it seems to me it's not ironic. It's not done with this sort of arch spirit of irony. Well, that's really interesting you said that to me because I think when I first started off as an artist, irony was a cool thing. It yeah, was yeah. Postmodernism yeah, was the nineties, yeah. and if you just drop that word in everywhere yeah. to give it elevate the work, yeah. But it isn't a very satisfying place to live in. Yeah, you know, yeah. to be for that to be your staple kind of uh, mindset. It can be, it can erode you as a human being, I think, uh, because you're being too arch and being yeah. too kind of detached, yeah. and you've got to show some sort of compassion or some sort of uh, warmth or positivity in all human dealing, or yeah. you're, yeah. you know, you will become quite wizened yeah. as a person, I think, yeah. if you don't. So, um, I'm glad you don't pick up yeah. too much irony. Yeah. It's something I hopefully I've been, uh, you know, shedding uh, as I matured. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can you then talk briefly about one of his most recent works, the Southwark War Memorial? There's a work of yours um, which is going to open uh, near here, uh, about 15 minutes down the road, um, in Southwark um, very soon. Perhaps you could say a little bit about that. It ties together some of these themes we've been discussing. Yeah, I guess it does. It's... Um, it's a memorial, uh, again, which uh, arguably you could say there's maybe too much of that, too many memorials. Maybe we need to think about just putting up good sculptures. Sometimes I feel that the whole discussion around memorials is always about context and about, um, about identity. And while these are super important things, I think sometimes they can uh, overwhelm a discussion about formal sculpture, which ultimately a good formal sculpture will communicate those issues more yeah, effectively. Yeah, that's where I'm going with it. But this particular, this was a really difficult brief, a really challenging brief, and I really loved it and f feared what I was asked to do. It was basically, I was asked to, to try and articulate the trauma of war uh, 
uh, to make a contemporary war memorial, but not to address it through, say, a particular battle or a particular group of combatants or, or combatants at all, but just society. How does war traumatise society? Uh, and also, can you make this a positive thing? You know, can, you, can you look for something redemptive in this, in this mess and, and try and, and give us a, a focal point for the community? Um, and this was done in, 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 in a redesigned area of the Haygate, which is uh, just oh, off yeah, the yeah, Walworth yeah. Road. Yeah. So where the old Haygate estate was is now being brand new housing. Uh, and, the, and the council asked for this war memorial. I was in a shortlist. I got through and won the competition. And I tried to integrate the, the idea into the, the, the landscaping of the square, which overlooks the old Southwark uh, Library and Museum. And I've asked, so I've been working with the landscape architects to try and bring in a lot of new trees. And uh, there's also some very old trees, London plane trees at the back of the site. And in amongst this sort of forest or arbor, if you like, is a, a cast bronze tree. So there's a horizontal tree um, in amongst these living vertical, obviously, trees. <laughs> and uh, and there's a line of text from a poet called Hamish Henderson, who, is, uh, who fought in um, El Alamein and or the North Africa campaign. And the line from the poem says, um, against the armor of the storm, I'll hold my human barrier. And on top of the tree is a figure of a youth. Um, when you say a youth, I mean, it's it seems to be quite a young child, is that right? How old or? Oh, no, I would say he's, he's, he's more like a 14 okay. year old, okay. 14 okay. year old boy. So just a teenager. Right. So I wanted a figure who was on the cusp of adulthood. Right, right. Um, and that figure could, could be seen as like, if the tree represents the fallen and the trauma of war, the youth could represent the kind of uh, chance of redemption, chance of re regeneration, right, right. renewal, um, and also the kind of family ties, I guess, you know, the idea of the family tree or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know, that war isn't exclusively experienced by combatants now. It's civilian collateral is really major, and in fact, probably dwarfs most of the combatants. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and then there's all the displacement and economic hardship that goes in the wake of that. And also, you know, if, you're, if your father was a combatant or your mother was a combatant, you end up you know, and they survive all that, you're still the son of that person who are probably living with that trauma. So there's no doubt you're going to feel that trauma as their child. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that goes on. So it's, it's a ripple, you know, war's like a, like a, it's, it, it echoes, yeah. it fades out obviously over time, but um, I think a lot of attempts to capture war in memorials, do focus on the kind of uh, yeah, the, the the combatants and the and the conflict itself. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, there's you know this profound modern challenge to be able to understand war outside the scope of the heroic. Um, it's so difficult and, and and obviously so important. I mean, it seems that seems a great example to end on because I mean you have so many of these themes we talked about in both the displacement of you know it's no longer the great general kind of staring down at us, and then also these kind of complex references to the tradition. I mean, I, when I saw the imagery, I was thinking of this kind of tradition of stump sculptures, you know, with these sort of great marble figures, you know, Hercules or whatever, or, you know, some kind of classical hero leaning on these, um, these wooden stumps, which are, yeah, yeah. of course, there as a sort of secret prop to hold up the sculpture. That's true, yeah. and, and here, the, I guess, the prop, in a sense, the, the stump has, um, is, is very visible, is very straightforward. Um, and you've lost the kind of faux, um, faux heroism that it's allowing in those, uh, in those other cases. Um, and of course, you know, the sort of muscle-bound hero with his weapons is replaced with this, um, this youth, this, this man, this child, this kind of person at these points of intersection, who's going to be the one who is going both to suffer the damage and also perpetrate some of it. You could also say the monumental tradition has favored the achiever, obviously, yeah. the exceptional individual has been yeah. a big, philosophical thing, isn't it, yeah. that we celebrate the, the, the exceptional individual, whereas the child is a kind of, um, hasn't achieved anything as, in terms of 
human affairs, yeah. um, but could arguably represent potential um, and uh, that the future is unwritten. Yeah. You know, mm. and that in itself is a is, is a is a is a is a is a note of optimism in a way. You know. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. Kenny, fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much.